Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Selena Larkin, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. We're excited to be joined by our guest speaker, Dr. Sarah McArdle. Dr. McArdle is a senior staff scientist at the La Jolla Institute Microscopy Core Facility, where she contributes to projects by developing methods and tools to acquire and quantify images in an efficient and accurate way. Sarah holds a bachelor's degree from Columbia University and a PhD in bioengineering from the University of California, San Diego. She's also a recipient of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Imaging Scientist Award. Following today's presentation, we'll have time for a question and answer session. Please submit your questions in the Q&A window at any time throughout the presentation. I'll hand off to you, Sarah, and thank you again for speaking with us today. Uh, thank you, Selena, for having me. Uh, I, I really appreciate the chance to talk about one of my favorite subjects in the world, which is open source software and uh, quantifiable image analysis. Um, so the, the topic of today is multiplex immunostaining. Um, and this is a great method for high dimensional analysis of a single sample um, where you can get uh, many antibodies to do really complex phenotyping. Um, and unlike, say, flow cytometry or RNA-seq, you can also get these spatial relationships between targets of interest. And this is essential for studying things like cell recruitment, tissue development, sig signaling mechanisms, et cetera. Uh, and uh, multiplex immunostaining of slides also lets you see the heterogeneity of cells either within tissues or between locations in the same tissue. Uh, at the La Jolla Institute, the multiplex instrument we have is the Verisite Orion. This is a wide field slide scanning microscope designed for a formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue sections. It can do up to approximately 18 channels. Um, and the procedure is really easy. It's just a single staining round with directly conjugated antibodies and it acquires a whole slide in about three hours with additional post-processing computational time. Um, I like this machine, but uh, everything I'm about to say um, about analysis works on any sort of multiplexing instrument, whether it's a cyclical staining um, or a um, mass cytometry based uh, machine. Um, uh, one of the things we really like about the Orion is that it, it does whole slide images. Uh, uh, this is a tonsil. And as you can see, um, you first start with the entire anatomical context of the whole organ. And then you can zoom in and in and in until you um, are, are phenotyping individual cells. And having this anatomical context is essential for finding either rare or spatially varying phenomena. Uh, and it's also really helpful for getting enough cells um, for uh, true statistical quantification. Um, he here's uh, some more example data from that uh, 17 plex uh, human tonsil. And one of the things I um, I was really impressed with the, with the Orion is how accurate the spectral unmixing is um, be, between the, uh, this is 16 antibodies, a nuclear stain and, um, and an autofluorescence that is also extracted. Um, and the spectral unmixing is so accurate in part because the images have this really high dynamic range with a 16 bit output. And it's also sufficient resolution at about uh, 0.325 microns per pixel to really um, get the shape of the cells and, um, and, and be able to do cell level analysis. The output file after all of the post-processing is a open source um, OME TIFF, um, which brings me nicely uh, um, to talking about image analysis. <laughs> um, as I said at the beginning, uh, I, I strongly believe in using open source software whenever possible. I work in a core facility. Um, and whenever anyone comes to me, I try to use open source software um, to solve their problems. Um, open source software, it's uh, free for all use, both academic, per personal, and commercial. And the source code itself is available online to be read or modified to suit your own purposes. And there's a lot of reasons to use an open source platform. The uh, biggest one by far is that it is broadly accessible. Um, it, it, people without large institutional resources uh, can still use it, which means um, it's much better for collaborating between labs or between institutions because you don't have to have every member of a project pay for an expensive license. Um, and it's also great for data sharing 
uh, the NIH has recently um, up updated its uh, requirements for data sharing. And um, now there's much more of an emphasis for everyone to be able to access your data. And if you're using something open source, you can just put the entire project um, on, on a uh, sh sharing platform and your reviewers or future readers can all see your data directly. Um, because it's broadly accessible, there's also greater community involvement. Uh, for instance, there's the uh, image.sc forum um, where there's a great community of people who really try to help beginner users to image analysis using a, a lot of different soft, um, software platforms. Um, and this community means uh, open source software tends to be uh, quickly adapted to the latest developments. If there's a brand new segmentation algorithm or clustering algorithm or whatever, uh, um, it can get implemented in an open source platform very quickly. Uh, also, a lot of people, particularly uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, like open source software because of the security. You can, if you choose, read every single line of code that you're about to install on your, your system and know for sure that it's not going to do anything bad to your data, do anything bad to your hardware. There's nothing there that's a secret. You, your IT can um, be really confident in what you're installing. Uh, there's a lot of different... Um, open source platforms for image analysis. The most famous of which is, of course, ImageJPG. Uh, there's QPath, uh, Cell Profiler, IC, and the Python ecosystem, most specifically in Napari. These all have different pros and cons. Um, they're all uh, aimed at different use cases. Um, but for this multiplex full slide image analysis, um, I, um, I prefer QPath. Um, and that is specifically because Multiplex whole slide images are computationally expensive. It is common um, for slides to be 50 or 100,000 pixels in, in both dimensions, leading to like 25 million pixels total. The, the example tonsil file that I've shown a few times is 95 gigabytes, and it can easily have a million cells to segment, uh, phenotype, and measure. So finding a way to view and analyze this data in an efficient manner is quite a challenge. The um, most common way of solving this is called the pyramid image format. Uh, this is to um, a, a way of fixing the fact that you cannot possibly fit all of the pixels with all of the data into your RAM simultaneously, no matter how good your computer is. So the image file itself contains multiple levels of resolution or different, really different zoom levels. When you first open an image, it'll show you uh, just this top layer that is the most zoomed out and then as you pick a spot and zoom in and in and in, it just kind of goes down the pyramid, just showing you the um, pixels that you need to see on your screen at that moment and uh, not trying to process all of them simultaneously. Um, this, pyram th this pyramid format is also um, very easily adapted to uh, tiling and batching to, to do whole, uh, true whole slide analysis at full resolution. There is a few file formats that do this natively. Uh, OMATIF is one of them. Um, as well as uh, CZI, SVS, and NDPI, and some others. Uh, QPath is a uh, free open source full slide image viewer and analysis platform, excuse me, that is designed ex uh, specifically to work with pyramided images. It works on any operating system, Windows, Mac, uh, Linux. Um, it works with really minimal computer specifications. You can run it with a laptop with eight gigabytes of RAM, though, of course, the more powerful your, process is, your processor is, the faster your analysis will go. Um, and it works with both threat field and fluorescence imaging. It was developed by Dr. Pete Bankhead at the University of Edinburgh. Um, it's worth mentioning, I don't work for QPath or, uh, or Pete. I'm just a super fan of the software. So I use it all the time. I talk about it a lot. <laughs> um, I'm on the ImageSC forum helping people use it, but I, I don't actually have any <laughs> official affiliation with Pete. Okay. Um, so uh, here are some common tasks in multiplex image analysis. Uh, you typically want to view your data, validate it in some way, then do cell detection, cell phenotyping, and then start looking for spatial insights into what's going on in your tissue. Um, I really, really like QPath's uh, viewer. Um, it, it's a very uh, intuitive and user-friendly way of viewing this data. 
with um, so many channels, uh, this this particular file has 17 channels, it's impossible to see all of them simultaneously and um, have all of the different 17 possible colors hitting your eyes and still understand what's going on. So there's going to have to be um, some way of turning on and off in channels, or for instance, using this uh, mini channel viewer that you see here to try to get a sense of all of the, um, what all of the different markers are so that you could really pick one cell and see if, is it double, triple, quadruple positive for any of your markers or, or find rare cells that have just the right combination. Um, you can also use this to see if um, markers themselves are co-localized. Uh, for instance, in this particular example, the CD68, which is a macrophage marker, tends to be cytoplasmic, but the CD11C, which is a different type of macrophage marker, tends um, to be more membrane bound. Once you've looked at your images, it's important to validate them in a in a truly quantifiable way. Um, look, looking at them is, of course, the first step, but it's not enough to just say it looks pretty. Uh, so in this case, what I did was look at the KI67 staining index. Um, staining index is a, it's a metric that actually comes from flow cytometry. It's the difference between the positive cells and the negative cells intensity divided by two times the standard deviation of the negative cell population. Um, so here I marked every tonsil, uh, every uh, follicle in the tonsil, and then measured the uh, KI67, um, which is a marker of cell proliferation. It's the yellow cells that you see it in this top image. Um, in the bottom image, you can I, I've um, made a map of the actual staining index in every tonsil, uh, where the brighter ones have brighter staining. And what you can see is, in general, the middle of the tissue appears to be a little brighter. You, of course, expect biological variation in, in a tissue. That's just life. Um, but there, there's definitely this trend um, where the, the middle of the tissue stains brighter, um, which suggests that there is some uh, inconsistency in fixation. Uh, this is um, a, a slide we just bought from a biobank. Um, so we don't know exactly how it was created, but it, it looks like maybe the uh, fixative either didn't penetrate all the way or it actually, the, the middle is fixed correctly and the edges are slightly overfixed. Um, so a metric like this is useful uh, for measuring staining uh, consistency across batches, consistency across regions um, or, uh, or across samples. Uh, we also use something very similar for methods optimization. Um, in this case, we took three slides from the same block one, we used the standard protocol. One, we used a new antigen retrieval chamber. And then one, um, we repeated the staining um, with the new antigen retrieval chamber on a slide that had been stored for three months. And in all honesty, we know that the slide was not stored properly. It, um, there, we detected a little bit of moisture inside the box. Um, so that the slide wasn't fantastic quality. Uh, um, and, uh, these slides were not quite sequential, but they were from the same block. So we, we were able to find six basically equivalent regions um, on each slide and then generate a, a lot of tiles, as you see here on the right. And for every, every channel, all 17 of them, um, I found positive and negative tiles um, for every channel in every region. I did this using a QPath's multiplex classifier. And then in each region, I calculated the staining index. Um, and here are the results. Um, here are the, all of the channels I measured. The uh, black is the SI using the standard protocol. The red is with the new antigen retrieval method. Um, in general, the red bars are a little bit higher than the black bars, suggesting that this new antigen retrieval, I spelled retrieval wrong, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> um, that this new antigen retrieval uh, does actually work a little bit better. It's not it's not every single channel, but in general, the slides are a little bit brighter. Um, and then the slide that was aged three months is noticeably worse. Um, still, still good enough quality that we could absolutely get meaningful information out of it, um, but we wouldn't be able to just straight compare it to um, one of the other uh, slides and just pretend that it can all just be one batch. Um, so. Yes, it is important to optimize your protocols and do so in a quantifiable way. And it's also important to use fresh slides.
Okay. Uh, after you've looked at your slides and validated that your staining is, is good quality, um, it's time for some actual cell detection. Uh, QPath has a built-in uh, watershed-based method that is very efficient and can process a whole slide in just a couple minutes. Um, uh, but it also has access to some of the latest deep learning algorithms, such as Stardust, CellPose, and the Segment Anything model. Uh, cell, CellPose and the Segment Anything model specifically were actually written by uh, by members of the community. These were not written directly by Pete. Um, sorry, Stardust also, of course, was um, it, it, it's a famous model. It was also not written by Pete, but he wrote the extension that brought it into QPath. And then uh, other other people out there on the internet wrote, wrote other <laughs> extensions for cell pose and the segment anything model. And they just put them out there on the internet for free, um, which is one of the wonderful things about open source software is you can have access to these things um, because everyone just wants to share. Uh, so what uh, the image on the right here is um, start a segmentation applied to this human tonsil. If any of you have ever worked with tonsils, you know that these cells are incredibly dense and um, overlapping, and this is a particularly challenging sample to segment, um, but Stardust actually does a very good job. Um, and the QPath interface for all of these models makes it very easy to optimize parameters for your particular uh, samples and either use existing models or even train your own. Okay, once you've detected your cells, it's time to actually phenotype them, and you can do that either by just using a straight threshold like, like flow cytometry gating um, or by training machine learning classifiers um, to do more complex phenotyping. Um, and then you could do that for every class in your multiplex set and then identify rare cell subsets by either combinations of markers that you weren't expecting or cells uh, in unexpected locations. Um, for instance, in, in this example, I just looked at three channels CD4, FOXP3, and PD1 um, uh, made eight possible combinations of positive and negative for each of them. And you can see on the right the um, numbers of cells of each class. And the thing I want to actually bring your attention to is this brown class, which is CD4 negative, FOXP3 positive, PD1 positive. And that should not exist. That's not a, a, typ a known cell type. Um, so this is actually a sign that one of my classifiers wasn't um, as wasn't one hundred percent accurate. Of course, it's not; they never are. Um, but it's just a way of getting a, a measure of how accurate your classifiers really are. And there, there's about fifteen thousand cells in this square, and one of them I know for sure to be bad, and that's really not such a bad. So that's okay. That's an acceptable accuracy level. Okay, and then. Um, after you've discovered what your cells are, you can really start to get spatial insights into your tissue and how your cells are relating to each other. Uh, within QPath, it's very easy to measure the distance between cells. Um, what you see here in blue are CD68 positive macrophages, and all of the segmented cells are CD4 T cells um, that, uh, from the previous slide. And they are col colored by the distance between um, every CD4 cell and its nearest CD68 neighbor, um, going from basically no distance to up to 35 microns in this particular section. Um, you could also do things like easily calculate cell frequencies in different locations in the tissue. For instance, this is the amount, the frequency of CD8 cells in every follicle. And um, you can see how much that varies uh, across a tissue. Um, there's some other QPath features that I, I don't have time to talk about now that are really useful for multiplex staining. Uh, for instance, there's image alignment for cyclic staining. Um, if you're using something like the Aquaria platform, um, you can, uh, if you're not happy with the alignment, you can fix it in QPath. There's a, a uh, tissue microarray analyzer um, that will help you uh, keep track of the entire grid of TMAs and uh, um, correlate them with any clinical parameters you have. There's uh, batch processing so that anything anything you do on one slide, you can very easily just uh, um, apply to every slide in your project. There is a scripting interface for calculating custom measurements. Uh, this uses Groovy, which is a language based in Java. Um, my favorite feature by far, uh, I've mentioned a few times, is the ImageSC forum for community support. 
uh, this is a really a great resource for QPath or for any other open source software um, where uh, people with questions, whether they're beginners or advanced users, uh, can ask the entire internet for help. And it's a, it's a really friendly place, both with people who want to help each other do better science. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, workflows uh, to in interface QPath with other open source tools, such as uh, ImageJ um, for a lot of the, the standard processes that you can do there. There's clustering and UMAP dimensionality reduction in Cytomap. Um, and for those of you who study the brain, that, that, um, there's a workflow for uh, aligning your slides with the brain anatomy, um, the, the Allen Brain Atlas, as well as many more. You can even write your own. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, listening. I also want to thank Zbigniew, Dr. Zbigniew Mikulski, who is the uh, director of the microscopy core here at LJI, uh, Dr. Pete Bankhead for writing QPath, and Edward Lowe and George Norber Josh Norberg and the rest of the team at RareSight, who um, really have worked with us very closely to optimize this panel um, and get our system up and running and get really great data. And I want to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, for my funding for the Imaging Scientist Grant. If you have any questions, please either post on the forum or email me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah, for a great presentation. As a reminder, if you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A window. And to start off our questions and answers today, our first question is around Plex. And uh, someone is asking us, Sarah, you've shown us up to 18 channels being collected simultaneously. Um, what do you, how many markers do you think are generally needed to classify cell types? Oh, that's a really hard question because it really depends on your project. There isn't a single number. Um, up until now, like we've been using four and getting reasonable science. I, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like you have to use this really these brand new systems where you can't do anything. Um, uh, where, uh, like I said, I'm at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology and immunology is, is particularly known for needing 10, 20 markers at a time to really understand what a T cell is because there's so many different types of cells and what they could be doing. Um, but some tissues need, uh, some tissues need a lot less. Um, some some can be done with standard, standard fluorescence and some need a lot more. Um, 15 seems to be a pretty good number for us. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question is uh, talking about data quality and validation of new panels. Yeah. Um, could you talk about uh, any experience you might have on comparing new panel validation using one-step staining versus, let's say, cycling, like cyclic approaches? Uh, yeah, I... Um... We only have the Orion in-house, so I don't really want to talk about the cyclic approaches. I, I don't have um, really personal experience with them, um, but I will say it is it is really important to me to um, truly QC my uh, my my prep and like really make sure that everything is valid, is is quantifiable, is um, is true, and. Uh, one of the things that we like with the Orion is there's actually very little run cost to it. it, it you're only paying for the antibodies. Um, so it becomes not such a big deal to try to, you can run IgG controls or you can run single color controls and check your bleed through. You can run all the controls you want because it's not that expensive or that time consuming. Um, whereas I, I, I do know with some cyclical systems, um, it's really every slide is super expensive. Um, or with uh, say like hundred plex systems, the panel itself it is crazy expensive, and also you can't modify it, so you can't just run one antibody. Um, so it's it it's more difficult to QC that data. Thank you. Um, another listener has a question regarding autofluorescence. Mm -hmm. Um, notice that you had autofluorescence channels collected in some of your data. Can you talk about how you use or manage inherent autofluorescence in slide samples? Yeah, so the Orion system comes with a autofluorescence removal step. Um, this is a combination of 
uh, hydrogen peroxide and uh, UV light that really reduces down the autofluorescence. And this is one of the things that makes it a lot um, easier to get uh, good spectral on mixing because there's just less, less autofluorescence on the tissue to begin with. Um, and therefore you can see uh, damning antibodies. In addition, it actually extracts the autofluorescence signal um, that, that is remaining. It, you can't possibly get rid of all of it. In, in my experience, what's uh, the remaining signal mostly comes from red blood cells. Um, so it's actually a super convenient tissue marker. Like you can see where the big blood, um, you can see the blood cells. You can sometimes see the elastin in the larger vessels. It's just a great way of looking at anatomy. Um, Great, thank you. Um, question here is, what are the features of precision microscopy platforms and the data that they generate that are necessary for your quantitative analysis? Well, one of the big features is that you want to be able to look at um, the intensity of every cell, not just as a yes, no, but at, as an actual quantifiable number. Um, so having um, having a large dynamic range helps with that, so you can see dim uh, samples. It also means that your, um, if you've set up your scope correctly, your um, signal should never be oversaturated, uh, which is absolutely important for getting good spectral and mixing and getting good, um, get, getting good intensity values. I I didn't show any data here about doing more complex um, analysis methods like dimensionality reduction or clustering. Um, but to to use them, you really need um, you really need like intensity values, not just not just the uh, gating based cell phenotyping. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. Um, I think that's all that we have time for today. Uh, we had a lot of great questions submitted and thank you again, Sarah, so much for a great presentation and, and great questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please, uh, you can expect a follow up from a member of the rare site team in the next few days and we'll make sure that we get all of the questions answered for you. So thanks again very much, Sarah, for speaking with us. Thanks to those listening and for joining us today and wishing everyone a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.